My name is Jody Bechtel. I am the Deputy Director of Clark County's Department of Environment and Sustainability. Uh, we are going to be talking to you about rule development for our state implementation plan requirements under a moderate non-attainment for the 2015 Ozone National Ambient Air Quality Standard. And there we go. Um, so our Division of Air Quality within the department serves as the Air Pollution Control Agency for Clark County. Um, this slide just gives you um, some of the contact people for this effort um, and particularly the rule development and drafting. Um, Richard Beckstead, Lynn Hutchinson and Ted Lendis are going to be doing the bulk of the rule writing and we will have um, contact information to reach out if you guys have questions after this discussion. So we had our first stakeholder meeting on our new attainment designation on January 12th. So this workshop is one of seven workshops to review the particular regulations we are looking to promulgate. Um, these meetings are being recorded and can be found on our website. I will put a link to where you can find this information in the chat uh, once I complete my, my slides. Um, we will have time during this meeting to address some of your questions. We're asking to hold questions till the end, um, but you are welcome to type them into the chat as they come to you if you prefer. Um, and again, then you can raise your hand and we'll call on you when we get to a question and answer portion. If we don't get to all your questions, we will do our best to get back to you um, with answers. And again, this is probably the first of some several um, information exchanges on these efforts. So in our January meeting, we reviewed the ozone situation we are facing. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of the detail here. I do encourage you to watch the video or review the presentation from the meeting on the 12th for the specifics. Uh, we were in marginal non-attainment for ozone. And with the current standard of 70 parts per billion, we have been bumped up to moderate non-attainment. This slide graphic shows kind of the situation where we are with ozone. We've been trending downward uh, for the last 20 years, but as you can see in the last few years, we're kind of stuck at this plateau of the mid to low 70s. And uh, with the 70 parts per billion uh, standard, we need to get below 70 parts per billion um, to meet attainment. So the bump up in classification requires that we achieve attainment by August 3rd of 2024. We must establish emission control requirements in a state implementation plan, including rule development on uh, reasonably available control technology requirements. We're required to do a 15% rate of progress and we are required to have contingency measures in place. Uh, under EPA's final bump up rule, EPA uh, requires us to submit um, the state implementation plan by the retroactive date of January 1st, 2023. Again, obviously that um, is in the past and we have not met that date, but that does set kind of the aggressive schedule that we are working under to try and get things in place as soon as possible for the attainment date of August 3rd, 2024. Um, because we are uh, working under the deadline that has passed, we need to get these controls in place as soon as possible, or we are at risk that EPA could start a sanctions clock, which could lead to loss of federal highway funds and other penalties, and could also allow EPA to impose a federal implementation plan or FIP to implement control requirements. And again, a lot more detail was provided in the January 12th meeting, um, so I encourage you to look at that presentation for more background. So we identified these sources that are shown bulleted on your screen here as needing action and rulemaking um, for the reasonable, reasonably available control technology um, part. These actions and those on the next slide are the rules we are discussing in this series of workshops. So we are additionally needing to show a 15% volatile organic compounds emission reduction over our baseline, independent of emission reductions necessarily to achieve attainment. Um, as well, we are required to have contingency measure rules on the books that would be triggered if we haven't reached attainment by August 2024. So these are the actions being considered for that 15% VOC ROP reduction and uh, contingency measures. 
So some of these overlap with the CTG RACT actions and rules from the previous slide, and those overlaps will be discussed in these workshops. We expect and hope not to have to implement all of these actions, and we will know for certain which ones are needed once our attainment model is completed, which we expect to have sometime toward the end of April. Uh, we are discussing all of these with stakeholders as if we need them all due to the tight schedule. So this table identifies the statutory deadlines that we're working under. Again, EPA Region 9 is aware that the SIP submission deadline is passed and therefore unrealistic, and um, Division of Air Quality is working closely with EPA to show good faith progress to develop the SIP and adopt regu uh, related regulations as expeditiously as expeditiously as possible in 2023. Uh, we will review the expected rulemaking timeline in each of these workshops um, to go over again that rulemaking particular deadlines, uh, which is based on an attempt to get these rules in place in the summer months of our ozone season when we have the most exceedances. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Lynn Hutchinson, who will go over the decreasing rule development. I'm going to talk about the metal solvent cleaning CTG, which is otherwise known as the degreaser CTG. Um, I have placed a link for the URL to EPA's CTG document in the chat box for this session. Um, that CTG dates back to 1977, so it's a pretty old uh, control technology guideline document. Uh, the uh, CTG does not establish any specific emission limitation that degreasers need to meet, but instead establishes work practice requirements and operating requirements um, as racked. Industries affected by the CTG rack generally fall in uh, industrialization code 25, 33, and 39. And such industries as the automotive industry, electronics, appliances, plumbing, the list here is not all inclusive. These are just examples of the kinds of industries where you might find degreasers present. Later in this presentation, we're going to talk about the possibility of adopting additional degreaser regulations beyond the CTG route. Uh, to meet possible ROP or contingency measure requirements that Jody went over. Um, those requirements, when we get into the phase two, what we're calling the OTC model rule, actually affect more than just metal degreasing. They go in to cover any kind of degreasing operation on any kind of surface, including things such as plastic and fiberglass, ceramics, whatever uh, degreasers are used for. So we're going to talk um, some basics here so that we make sure that everyone out there understands what we are talking about. Um, so what is a degreaser? A degreaser removes deposits such as grease, oil, wax, tars from the surface of metal. Um, the EPA CTG discusses three types of degreasers. The first is a cold cleaner. The second is an open top vapor degreaser, and the third is a conveyorized degreaser. We're going to go over each of these designs in the next few slides. But I wanted to back up and essentially tell you the way these things are used in the industrial and commercial world. So one way is as a maintenance cleaner, where the degreaser is used to clean parts periodically. So for example, in an automotive um, company, you might remove an engine from a car and then use a degreaser to clean parts of the engine or the engine entire, the entire engine um, might be placed into a degreaser. You can also see degreasers in the manufacturing line at a manufacturer where the cleaning step is actually a step in the process to make a final end product. So you might degrease a piece of metal that then is later um, in an assembly line. Degreasers are generally, generally uh, characterized as batch or inline machines. Batch machines are where all the parts are kind of loaded into a basket and then lowered into a solvent in uh, an open top container. Um, under EPA's CTG, cold cleaners are cleaners where 
a batch process is used and the solvent is not heated to that solvent's boiling point. Once cleaned, parts can be held over the degreaser to drain, or they might be moved to the side of the degreaser um, on a separate drying rack. EPA reported back in 1977 that the general dimensions of batch degreaser, um, on average, the opening is about four feet wide. Now that dates all the way back to 1977, and we really don't know if that's kind of the current state of designs, and I'm kind of telling you where EPA was in their th thinking in 1977. So let's look at the emission points from a cold cleaner. There are five areas that a cold cleaner can have emissions points from. Uh, the first is evaporation from the degreasing solvent out through the open top. Um, there can also be an agitation emissions point where agitation can be used in a degreaser to provide better surface coverage of the part and improve uh, the degreasing action, but that agitation can increase the emission, the evaporation rate and thereby increase emissions. You can also have um, emissions from what's called carryover. Carryover is where that part is moved out of the degreaser or maybe held over the degreaser, and the solvent basically evaporates off the part in order to dry the part. You can also have emissions from the nozzle. The spray nozzle, if it's under a high pressure, can cause a lot of splashing in the degreaser, which can result in extra emissions happening at the degreaser. And finally, the last point, um, which is actually point four, so it's not last point in the diagram, but it's at the bottom of the diagram, um, is waste solvents. Waste solvents from the cold cleaners back in 1977, EPA labeled these as the largest source of emissions from cold cleaners. And really the amount of emissions are gonna be dependent on how responsibly those waste solvents are handled. So the next type of degreaser is an open top vapor degreaser. In contrast to the cold cleaners, open top vapor degreasers heat the solvent above the solvent's boiling point, such that vapors are formed above the In this operation, the parts are still loaded into a basket or some other conveyance device. And instead of being lowered all the way down into the solvent, they're lowered into the vapor, what's called the vapor zone. Um, at that point, the parts are cooler than the vapor in the vapor zone. And so when the vapor hits the parts, the solvent condenses on the part, the um, outside of the parts, and that action causes the cleaning that needs to happen in the degreaser. A typical, a typical opening size for a open top vapor degreaser is slightly smaller at 3.5 uh, um, feet wide. On this diagram, you'll see the term freeboard um, showing. The freeboard of an open top degreaser is the distance from the top of the vapor zone, so that area where the vapors have evaporated and are just kind of hovering above the solvent, um, to the top of the degreaser. Um, as we'll talk about later, EPA CTG recommendations has a freeboard ratio. The freeboard ratio is the freeboard height divided by the width of the degree. The emissions profile from a vapor degreaser is different than a cold cleaner. The primary emission point in this kind of uh, cleaner is evaporation from the vapor zone. Um, we have far fewer emissions from the waste solvent than you saw in the uh, cold cleaner because many open top vapor degreasers have a recycling system in there where they recondense the solvent and send it back into the system. So we see less waste and less emissions from those points. A conveyorized degreaser uses a conveyor system belt type mechanism to lower parts into the solvent or vapor zone area, thus the name conveyorized degreaser. Um, and you can have either a cold system or a vapor system in this cleaning method. 
Um, both can be used. The emissions from these systems are often less than the batch type of degreasers because the, the solvent is in an enclosed system. But we do still have emissions points um, and they are similar emission points, they're just lower. Um, emissions from the waste are reduced in this system because the system also has a distiller that recirculates the, the solvent back into the system, uh, similar to the open top system. EPA recommended two types of control systems for each type of degreaser. The first, which EPA termed a control system A, consisted of only operating requirements, where control system B consists on add-on control devices and operating requirements. EPA presented the two different control options in their CTG, but also admitted that if everyone followed control system A, then there would be little need for control system B because the amount of extra emission reductions you would get by control system B may not war be warranted if everyone strictly adheres to A. But their research showed that not everyone strictly adheres to the control system A, and that's why they have a recommendation for control system B. And as we look across state CTG rules, we find that the majority of states have adopted both control system A and control system B with vapor, um, vapor pressure triggers for having to add um, add-on emission controls. So before I go further in talking about the CTG requirements, I want to note that Clark County had a rule 60.2 that is currently approved into e into Clark County's state implementation plan that applies countywide. That rule includes work practice requirements geared towards the kinds of requirements that would apply to cold cleaners. The rule itself does not say it's limited to cold cleaners, but when we do a comparison between that rule and the CTG rule, the overlap only occurs with the control system A on cold cleaners. Now, I use a term that this is a formal, a former rule 60.2. And I say that because in 2011, the county commissioners withdrew this regulation from Clark, Clark County's rules. This means that although the rule is still in the SIP and EPA can enforce that rule, DAQ is not enforcing the rule. And thus, for purposes of this SIP planning process, DAQ is assuming a 0% control effectiveness of that 60.2 rule. What that means is that we are basically saying the control effectiveness reflects how much of the regulated population can be said to be continually complying with the regulatory requirements. And because DAQ Q is not out there actively enforcing the SIP, we do not think that it is appropriate that we claim 100 or 50 or any effectiveness level for that rule. One option for moving forward to meet DAQ's VOC RACT uh, CTG requirement for degreasers is simply to reinstate the 60.2 rule. While this remains an option, um, there are several factors that make this approach less desirable. One, we are not certain how much credit EPA would allow us to apply um, for readopting a rule that should already be in place. Thus, if we re if DAQ readopts the rule, uh, EPA may not may allow just a little or even no credit for emission reductions in the SIP planning process. Second, the rule only, as I mentioned before, includes work practice requirements that align with the requirements for cold cleaners. So DAQ does not have data right now on the current population of degreasers that is out there in the county. This means that the rule may not be as effective as adoption of the requirements for all types of cleaners. So that so we are looking to go beyond the 62.2 requirements in adopting a CTG RACT. So let's step back and look more closely at what the CTG recommends for RAC for each type of degreaser. 
Control system A for cold cleaners has six work practice requirements for cold cleaners. I'm not going to read through this list um, because you all are capable of reading the list, um, but I want to note that all of these on this page are part of the, the um, EPA's CTG recommendations. What I've highlighted in blue is what is in the current or the current 62 point uh, 60.2 rule that's approved into the Clark County SIP. And what it, I've highlighted in orange are areas of that rule where Clark County differs from what the CTG recommends. So for example, the CTG recommends that no more than 20% of the waste is lost in disposal, whereas um, Clark County's rule brought that percentage down to 10 percent. Vapor top degreasers contain similar work practice requirements to what we see for the cold cleaners, but there are additional work practice requirements to better manage carryover emissions. Recall that those carryover emissions are what happens when the part is removed from the degreaser and either is held over the degreaser or moved to a side drying rack, and basically the solvent that's left on the parts evaporates into the air. Rack for vapor degreasers would also include a prohibition on the types of materials that can be used in the degreaser. Specifically, it would prohibit porous materials from being uh, cleaned in a degreaser. And this would be materials such as leather or wood or rope or, or the like from being used in the degreaser. Vapor, the control system B would require safety switches to handle such operating parameters temperature since the temperature of uh, the solvent is critical in uh, getting that vapor zone to operate effectively. It also includes requirements for design specifications for the freeboard ratio that I talked about earlier, um, that freeboard height to width of the degreaser, and it includes requirements for potential add-on emission controls. You'll notice the first work practice requirements for conveyorized degreasers deals with exhaust ventilation. This speaks to the ambient area around the degreaser. For example, minimizing use of high speed fans in the area. Um, if you have a high speed fan that can promote a higher rate of evaporation. So in conveyorized degreasers, they're trying to control not only the degreaser, but the ambient um, environment around that degreaser. The control system B for co uh, conveyorized degreasers has similar recommendations for control requirements, uh, carbon absorbers, et cetera, for the vapor degreaser. Included with the materials di distributed for today's workshop is Kentucky's rack rule. This rule closely parallels EPA's CTG rack recommendations for a combination of control system A and control system B. DAQ requests feedback on the suitability of adopting a similar type of rule for, DA for um, Clark County. Note that although the, the rules for RACT would only need to apply in HA212, the non-attainment area, we are per, DAQ is proposing to adopt the degreaser regulations countywide. So that's another area for comment, um, and I wanted to, to note that difference. Types of questions DAQ also re requests feedback on are the terms as they're defined in the Kentucky rule. EPA CTG recommendations don't include things like definitions in, in the guideline document. So Kentucky's definitions um, may seem completely reasonable, but they may not. And we, we wanna hear back from stakeholders on that. I happen to notice that, for example, Kentucky defines solvent as VOC, whereas if you look at the Virginia rules, they define a solvent in a very different way. Solvent there means an organic matter, which are liquid at standard conditions, which are used as dissolvers, 
viscosity reducers and cleaning agents. So um, there also may be other definitions for solvent out there. We want to land on the best way to describe how these rules apply. Um, we're also interested in knowing whether there are any aspects of the control system A or control system B that are really outdated uh, based on modern equipment design. As I mentioned, that CTG dates all the way back to 1977, and it may not be relevant for the kinds of degreasers that are actually out there in Clark County's population. We'd like to know if there's any additional work practices or cost-effective control requirements that should be considered for RACT at this point. Um, and finally, we'd also like to uh, talk about an implementation timeline. The Kentucky's rules provided 12 months for, um, for facilities to come into compliance from the effective date of the rule. Um, as we have discussed, we are on a very, or DAQ is on a very tight schedule to get these emission reductions in place and effective during the 2023 ozone season. So we request comment on whether uh, that is a doable implementation schedule. And if it's not, we'd like to know why it's not, uh, what needs to happen to bring these units in, and what would be a reasonable compliance schedule. The other thing we'd like some feedback on is exemptions. The CTG rule uh, makes two recommendations for exemptions. One is that no add-on control equipment would be required for conveyorized degreasers with smaller than a two square meter air vapor interface. And no chillers or carbon absorbers would be required for open top degreasers smaller than one square meter of open area. The Kentucky rule includes additional exemption for cold cleaners specifically. It has four requirements that if met would exempt cold cleaners from the requirements. Those are that the cold cleaner has a remote solvent re reservoir. The solvent used in the cold cleaner does not have a vapor pressure that exceeds 33 millimeters of mercury measured at 100 degrees Fahrenheit and it is not heated above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. It has uh, a sink-like work area for draining uh, that has less than 100 square feet of an opening, and the waste solvent stored or is properly stored and disposed of with minimum loss due to evaporation. So we request comment on whether and to include these kinds of exemptions for cold cleaners in DAQ's rule. At the beginning of the presentation, I also mentioned that we were looking at additional kind of rules beyond the CTG. Um, we looked to the OTC model rules. D DAQ may consider imposing either the phase one OTC model rule or the phase two OTC model rule to meet ROP or um, contingency measure requirements. The ozone, just to give you some background, the Ozone Transportation Commission was formed to help northeastern states come into compliance with um, ozone standards by looking at requirements that go beyond EPA CTGs. The OTC developed their phase one and phase two rules in 2001 and 2012, respectively. Um, the 2001 rule applies only to metal parts, just like EPA's CTG rule. And then the 2012 rule, as I mentioned, goes beyond metal parts to include uh, degreasing of other types of materials, such as plastic. The phase one and phase two rule also add requirements for a new kind of cleaner design called airtight and airless cleaning systems. So those are not part of CT, the CTG RACT recommendations, but they are regulated under both the phase one and phase two rules. I just wanted to note as kind of an interesting aside that if we were to impose, if DAQ were to impose the phase two rule, 
that um, the OTC determined that compliance with that rule would mean that the facilities could be exempt from EPA's halogenated degreaser requirements in Part 63, Subpart T, because compliance with OTC's Phase 2 rule would mean that basically all the solvents would meet um, a requirement that they are 5% or less VOC by weight, and that is the uh, applicability threshold for the MAC standard. So just as an aside to coordinate uh, rules here, um, if you if we move this direction, there could have the added benefit that sources could fall out of MAC compliance um, if EPA doesn't reverse their once in, always in uh, position, which is a whole long story in and of itself. But right now, uh, it, it would get you out of the MAC rule. The OTC model rule establishes hardware and operating requirements for vapor genes, as well as solvent vol volatility limits and operating practices for cold cleaners. Principal differences between the OTC phase one model rule and EPA CTG rule is the establishment of a vapor pressure requirement for solvents. Other differences are highlighted here in red. As I mentioned, the rule added requirements for airless cleaning machines and airtight cleaning machines. And there are different kinds of degreasers. These are different kinds of degreasers from the cold vapor and conveyorized degreasers that are covered by the CTG. Um, these kinds of degreasers generally have a lower emissions profile to start than any of the three that EPA would regulate under the CTG. In addition to setting new requirements for control system A and, and B, the 2001 OTC model rule provides an alternative emissions limit uh, approach, uh, which solvent cleaners could choose to comply with rather than the operating and control requirements in the rule. So this is another kind of just a, a meet this or meet this kind of requirement. In 2012, the OC, OTC revised its model rule to add an additional phase of requirements. The principal difference between the phase one rule and the phase two rule are the establishment of VOC content limits in the solvent used. The red highlights changes from the 2001 rule to the 2012 rule. As with the CTG rules and the Kentucky rules, DEQ is interested in feedback on issues related to imposing uh, some version of the OTC model rules in Clark County. For example, are any aspects of these models rules outdated? Again, because we're not really sure what the inventory in Clark County looks like. Can the CTG and phase one and phase two rules be applied successfully successfully in succession? Um, in other words, are there any implementation concerns with adopting one rule, then imposing the next rule, and then imposing the next rule? Would that lead to cost ineffective emission reductions? So we'd like to get feedback on that. We're also looking at the ways to compute the potential emission reductions from each one of these rules. And the amount of emission reductions is somewhat dependent on the existing inventory out there in Clark County, because all of the degreasers have beginning different emission profiles. When EPA did its CTG back in 1977, it estimated that 60% of the population were cold cleaners, 25% of the population were the vapor top degreasers, and 15% of the population were the conveyorized degreasers. When the OTC looked at this again in 2012, they found their own population to be 92% cold cleaners. DAQ thinks um, our, the gut, our gut feeling is OTC 92% or maybe even up to 100% appropriately would characterize DAQ's population as cold, mostly cold cleaners. But we'd be interested if anybody has any data out there to help understand uh, what that regulated population looks like. 
We'd also be interested to know whether there's any other state rules that would serve as a better, better model for either the CTG rule or the OTC rules as we move forward to consider this in regulation. Um, I had a hard time following, f finding a state rule that did only the CTG rule, and Kentucky was the best example that I could find, but uh, others out there who are more knowledgeable in this area may be able to point to a better, better model rule. Finally, again, we want to talk about exemptions. We already went over what OTC and Kentucky recommended as exemptions. And I did a survey of state rules out there, and I found a variety of exemptions out there. The list was extremely long. I don't know why all those exemptions exist and why they might be appropriate, um, but we are certainly requesting comment on that. And I've listed the types of exemptions that I found in other state rules in this list. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it back over to Araceli to go over the rulemaking timeline. Thank you, Lynn. If you could just keep your slide up for a minute and then I'll I'll go from there. So so this is the workshop is being held today and we're asking for all comments to be written comments to be submitted by March 1st. Um, then we would go. This is our most aggressive schedule. The earliest we would try to adopt a rule would be July 4th. So if we followed that time frame, we would take it for put it out for 30 day public notice on April 9th. Public notice would close on May 9th, and then we would schedule it for a public hearing on June 20th. It would then become effective 14 days later on July 4th. And I'm going to go ahead and, and pull up some slides that I have. Are you guys seeing my slides? Not yet. Let's see. Not yet. You guys are seeing those? They're up. Perfect. OK, so yes, as we as I discussed earlier, given the uh, the de deadlines EPA has placed on us, DAQ is adopting a fast paced schedule for implementing these rules. We need to adopt them so that they would produce emission reductions for the 2023 ozone season. And as I stated, we are accepting written comments, comments today, verbal comments today and written comments through March 1st. Um, we would then release the rule for a 30 day public notice, followed by a public hearing for adoption. And then again, like I said, the rule would become effective 14 days after adoption. Those who have registered for our respective distribution lists will receive updates on the development of these rules and our attainment plan. Um, you can also follow the development of our plan using the link on this slide. And in closing, uh, the Department Division of Air Quality will continue to engage both industry and clean air advocates in the development of our attainment SIP. Questions can be directed to the contacts on this slide and I will post them in the chat box. And again, if you wish to receive notices on plan development and have not already signed up for a distribution list, you can contact Alejandro Nunez, who is on this slide, um, and he'll make sure that you're added to our distribution list. And with that, I, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. Or you feel free, I'm not seeing any questions posted in the chat, so. No, I. Like I said, if, if you, if anyone attending thinks of any questions that they want to submit at a later time, please submit those in writing to Alejandro and he will make sure that um, or one of us will make sure that it gets addressed and um, passed on to others. But I think I think we can go ahead and close this meeting and I, so. uh, I don't know if Jody wants to make any final comments. 
Yeah, I was just going to thank everyone for participating and we do look forward uh, to hearing from you and please feel free to pass this information on to anyone that may be impacted or interested as well. So we'd like to do uh, to reach as many people as possible. So thank you and have a great afternoon. Oh, wait, Gary has a comment. <laughs> Oh, let me see. Let me un. So um, you're confused regarding what comment is being requested about the model rules. We are looking for you know any and every comment that you may have. So um, the presentation this morning and Lynn's presentation just now has some questions for particular information that we're looking for, but um, do not let that limit you. Uh, if we are looking for comments on, again, are there other rules that make more sense? If the rules that we're looking at, if there's aspects of those rules that you feel wouldn't work for industry here or um, that, you know, just need some some changes, um, constraints that these things may put on you. I mean, we're looking for um, kind of the scope and breadth of anything you may be concerned about or need more information about. Um, Lynn, any other? I mean, it's pretty much pretty much anything and everything, right? Yeah, no, the, the exemptions that should be added or not included in the rule either direction. Um, you know, we have the OTC model rules, but if there's a particular state rule that folks think would be uh, really a good model, as, as you said, Jody, um, rather than starting from the OTC rule, we could start from a, a, a state rule. Um, and, you know, the, the big question I'd love to get feedback on is if anybody knows what the population of the the degreaser population in Clark County looks like um, that would be very valuable information yeah and I mean we're kind of looking so assuming that them the model rule that we've provided on these efforts um, if we adopted that rule as is you know kind of what what would your comments be if we were putting this rule in front of you as if this was the rule we were going to adopt. So that's why we were providing model rules that the EPA has already approved um, that we would be modeling our rules after. So hopefully that answers oh, your question, I, I, Gary. Oh, go ahead, Lynn. I did, I did think of another way to, to phrase one of the questions. So we've talked about potentially adopting a degreaser rule to meet CTG requirements, to meet ROP requirements, and potentially contingency measure requirements. So if we were to do um, need the ROP requirement, we would likely skip a CTG rule, kind of like the Kentucky rule, and move on to doing the phase one um, model rule, the OTC phase one rule, so that we could claim credit both for ROP and the CTG and get additional emission reductions and then potentially consider uh, phase two in contingency measures. Um, alternatively, we could adopt the CTG rule now if we don't need the extra reductions now and put both phase one and phase two in contingency measures. And one of the questions I was asking was if we do a phased kind of approach where um, the Kentucky rule applies first with the prospect that the phase one rule apply if we failed to if DAQ fails to reach attainment by some date and then yet a further uh, emission reduction in putting phase two in place in some time down the road should that not uh, yield attainment it does that create implementation concerns. Are there things that that a facility would do to meet phase one that would be counterproductive to then turning around and doing phase two? So I'm, I'm looking for feedback on the ability to apply these in succession or whether we really need to make a choice that says we need to go for phase two now or um, phase one now or something without looking at a, a uh, three-tiered approach to regulation of degreasers. And then Gary, I mean, obviously if you have more questions about this, you're welcome to submit those to us. Um, but yeah, um, we're, we're happy to discuss further. If there's no other questions or comments, again, we will close this one out and um, we have a couple scheduled tomorrow, um, so we may see you then. Otherwise, we look forward to receiving comments from you. Thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Goodbye, all. Bye.
Thank you. Bye.